Hello, welcome and good evening once again to our evening service. We trust that you will um, know the Lord's blessing on this his own holy day and we trust that the Lord will um, presence himself amongst us at this time. Well, it's good to have you with us. Let us all begin the worship of God and let us do so by praising to his most glorious name from Psalm number three. Psalm three, we shall sing the whole of this psalm together. O Lord, how are my foes increased? Against me many rise. Many say of my soul, for him in God no succour lies. Yet thou my shield and glory art, the uplifter of mine head. I cried, and from his holy hill the Lord me answer neighed. We'll sing the whole of this psalm together to God's praise. Psalm number three. <clears throat> Oh Lord, how are my foes increased against me? Many rise, many say of my soul. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray.
O Lord, our God, grant us, we pray thee, to be still in our hearts at this time, that we might calm all our thoughts and quieten our spirits. Help us, O Lord, to know in the stillness of worship that Thou art our God. Thou hast said, Be still, and know that I am God. And, O God, we pray that stillness might be felt even as we pray. May we know something of that calmness of mind and peace of conscience as we worship Thee at Thy footstool in Thy holy hill. Grant us to know something of that blessing of which we sang only a moment ago. Thy blessing is upon thy people. And oh, uh, our God, we wonder that that is possible because we are sinners by nature and by practice. We deserve nothing from thy right hand. We only deserve thy wrath and indignation. But oh, we thank and bless thee that we know this blessing through the mediatorship of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Oh, give us to know him today in a deeper way than we have hitherto. This, this was uh, the Apostle's desire. He desired within his heart that he might um, be found uh, not in his own righteousness, which is of the law, but rather that righteousness which is of God by faith and through faith alone. And this is our own desire. We echo the Apostle's desire and we are conscious even of the words of the Saviour who said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We desire then that righteousness, which is to be found alone in Christ, imputed to us and received by faith alone, and all that we might know him afresh today, Father, all that we might know thy Son uh, in a more meaningful way, that we might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, that we might be conformed to him in his death. This is our desire, to know Christ. This is the most greatest and the most wonderful things that we can ever do, to be in a living and right relationship with thyself. To know Christ. Oh, Father, this is the sweetest thing that we can ever know and experience. And we pray, Lord, that thou wouldst this day lead us into a deeper uh, and a higher and, um, uh, and, a, and a wider understanding of thyself. As thou hast revealed thy being in and through Christ. Oh, that we might love Christ that he might be precious to us, that he would be that friend that sticks closer than any brother, that we might believe, though we do not see him with our own eye, but yet believing, we rejoice. Give us to rejoice, O God, and to rejoice with joy unspeakable, for our citizenship is in heaven. O Lord, we are richer than all the millionaires in this world, if we know Christ. Because if we know him, we know the one whom to know is life eternal. And if we know him, then there is therefore no, no um, uh, condemnation, no wrath. 
to thy people. And if we know him, then we, ha we have the greatest treasure of all. We have found that pearl of great price. We are laying up treasures for ourselves in heaven. Oh, we pray then that thou wouldst impress all these things upon us anew as we worship thee. May we go away rejoicing and refreshed in our hearts that we have met with thyself. Even though we come uh, in a somewhat artificial environment, um, we know that this is not the same, but yet we thank thee, O oh Lord, that thou art not confined to buildings made with hands. Thou was promised to be a little sanctuary to thy people as they gather. And we pray, O oh Lord, that thou wouldst be with us all as we meet in our own respective homes um, around the computer. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wouldst bless us and give us to know that unity of the brethren in the bond of peace. O oh Lord, may we feel, as it were, in the spirit, a sense of oneness, a sense of connectedness to our brethren in the faith. And may we know that through the power of thy spirit. O oh God, we pray that thou wouldst forgive us our many sins. O oh God, be merciful to us sinners. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that we have rebelled against thee, uh, that we have um, incurred thy wrath and indignation. And, O oh Lord, we would seek repentance in you. And we would seek that obedience which is after thyself. Grant us that repentance, Spirit. Give us to be broken in our hearts. And may we, O oh Lord, see more and more the evilness, the heinousness of sin, that we might all the more cleave unto the righteousness of Christ. Give us grace as we fight the good fight of faith. Give us grace to, um, uh, to wage war on our own sins, our own sinful proclivities and in inclinations. Help us, O oh Lord, to um, wage warfare um, against our own sinful deeds. We need thy help in this, O oh God. And, we, and we, we acknowledge, O oh God, that this is the right thing to do, but we confess at the same time that we look within and there is so much that disturbs there is so much that defiles and the good that we would, we do not and the evil that we would not, that we do. And these uh, things are contrary to us and we cannot do the things that we would. But, O oh Lord, by thy spirit, overcome our sins, that indwelling sin and deliver us, we pray thee, more and more from that sin that so easily ensnares and besets us. O oh Lord, deliver us from all these things. We thank thee for thine own strength, O oh God, because though our lusts and though our sins and though our sinful habits may be too strong for us, they are not too strong for thee. Thou canst subdue our iniquities, and we pray that thou wouldst do so. Cast our sins afresh behind thy back. O oh, we pray thee, Father, and have mercy upon us, for we are miserable offenders, Restore the penitent, O oh God, and increase our faith at this time. Give us to, um, give us to uh, hear afresh the words of the Saviour who said, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins are forgiven thee. O oh Lord, forgive our many sins and bless us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. O oh Lord, remember us as families. Remember us at this time. Remember the anxious, we remember especially those who are mourning, uh, those who are, are losing loved ones to this dreadful virus and we commit them into thy care and into thy keeping. And we pray, O oh Lord, that, um, that thou wouldst bless the voice of death as it goes before them. We remember thine own people, perhaps, who have lost loved ones in recent days and we pray that they might know um, that their relations, if they are thine, uh, are not dead, but only asleep in the Lord Jesus Christ. And all we thank thee that death is not the end, that death is only the beginning, that death has been transformed by thy cross and by thy wonderful resurrection, and by it thou hast changed it, so that it is a, a portal into glory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Oh, we thank thee that through Christ all these things have been conquered. Yea, we are more than conquerors 
through him that loved us. And so give us to know this day that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, that neither height nor depth nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come can separate us from thy eternal love. For thou hast said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with cords of loving kindness, I have drawn thee. O oh, draw us, O oh Lord, and we will follow after thee. Draw us into thy chamber at this time. Speak sweetly into our ears. Speak comfortably. Speak words of peace. And give us to see afresh the um, Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we pray then that thou would bless our worship. Once again, remember the sick and the suffering. Remember our nation at this time. Uh, a nation that is so far removed from thee. O oh Lord, have mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. And revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. O oh Lord, we pray that this virus would be a means of converting many. And we pray that thy word would go forth in much power in these days. Remember our Prime Minister, our Queen, the Cabinet, all those who rule over us. Grant them that fear of the Lord, we pray thee. We remember and those who are unemployed and perhaps struggling with finances at this time. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wouldst go before them in wonderful ways and give them to know that thou art the one who will provide all their needs. And thou hast promised, O oh Lord, that if they seek first the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto them. O oh Lord, help us not to worry in these worry worrisome times, but rather may our trust be in thee. May our stay, may our hope be in thyself. O oh, blessed one, help us now. Give us to worship thee acceptably and with godly fear. May we be caught up in the wonder of Christ. May we get lost in eternal and lofty things. Remember us as a people. Bless us with thy blessing. And all oh, forgive our sins for the Redeemer's sake. Amen. Well, can we turn to the New Testament and from the Gospel of Christ according to Luke? Luke chapter 2. And we shall read from verse 40. Luke chapter 2. Two and at verse forty, and Luke here um, is making the transition from uh, his account of John the Baptist into the young years of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, and in verse forty, he says, "And the child uh, grew and waxed strong in spirit." filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. 
And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not, or did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. Amen. And may the Lord be pleased to bless that reading of his own inspired and inerrant word, and to him be all the glory. Uh, perhaps before we um, begin the preaching of the word, that we would once again seek the Lord's blessing uh, in a brief word of prayer. Let us pray again. Our Lord and our God, we thank thee for thy word, and we bless thee that the entrance of thy word gives light to us. And we pray now that as we turn to it, that we might be sensitive to the leading and guiding of thy spirit in all these things. Uh, o oh Lord, bless the foolishness of preaching, and we pray that many might be encouraged and uh, strengthened in their faith. And O oh Lord, just give us eyes to see the wondrous things of thy law. Give us eyes to see the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, help us now, and grant us the power of thy spirit to be able to contemplate something of this wonderful portion of thy word. For Christ's sake. Amen. Well, let us return to that, that passage that we were reading uh, just a moment ago, Luke's Gospel and at chapter 2. And seeking the Lord's uh, help, uh, we would wish to consider uh, verse 49. Verse 49, and he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not, did ye not know that I must be about my father's business? Verses um, 41 to 52 form a remarkable account in Luke's gospel because they give us a glimpse of the life of the Saviour on earth during his young years. And it is the only glimpse that we have uh, and uh, an impenetrable veil uh, hangs over the 30 years during which our Lord was preparing for his great work. The apocryphal writers try to penetrate this veil by presenting Jesus as being omniscient and almighty with all sorts of animals, including leopards and the like, um, bowing down to worship him. One writer even goes so far as to write this, and I quote, At five years of age, he modelled twelve sparrows out of soft clay, clapped his hands, and they flew away. The divine record, however, does not reveal this. Our Lord Jesus Christ lived a life of obscurity for the 30 years that he was in Nazareth. And apart from the glimpses that Luke furnishes us with, nothing else is revealed about the child. Now, having said all that, we are given enough to learn that Jesus, 
at the age of 12 was no ordinary boy. There, are, there have been many child prodigies down through the years and each and every one of them are, have been extraordinary in their own right, but none of them, however great they may have been, none of them come close to the 12 year old who stood in the temple on that day. Here is a sight that is truly extraordinary. It, it's awe-inspiring. And, and, and I think it is a scene that the Lord's people should visit from time to time. I myself have, have preached from th these particular words a couple of times and I, I find myself really going back to these words. I find myself drawn to them on occasions. And, and though nothing supernatural takes place, nothing miraculous happens in this place, nevertheless, this is the moment in which the Saviour, as a boy, reveals that he knows who he is. He reveals it to his mother, Mary, and his legal guardian, Joseph. And he, and he also reveals something of his identity, I think, to the doctors of the law. We read that he was sitting at the feet of the doctors and asking them questions, and they were astonished at his understanding. And we might think to ourselves, well, did they know that this was the promised Messiah? You know, that there's that verse, isn't there, from Malachi 3, verse 1, that the messenger of the covenant would suddenly appear in his temple. Should they have made the connection that this was the Messiah? Well, this was an astonishing boy. And perhaps we might be inclined to think that they should have made that connection. Especially the doctors of the law. Well, verse 49, it's... It's Jesus' reply to um, the question uh, asked by his mother in the previous verse. She says, um, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Losing a child is every parent's nightmare. And in verses 45 and 46... Um, Mary and Joseph were experiencing uh, that same nightmare. And when they found him not, this is verse 45, when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors and, and so on. They thought that they had lost him. It's somewhat baffling, really, why Mary and Joseph didn't think to check the temple in the first place. I mean, there he was really hidden in plain sight. And perhaps we can understand why they didn't think like that, because when we're in a panic and we're caught off our feet, uh, the panic sometimes is so strong that seldom do we actually think straight. We, we think logically. And I imagine that was really what was going on here. Mary and Joseph found themselves in this turmoil and they were just seeking uh, him everywhere they could find him. But perhaps on a, a deeper and, and more spiritual level, perhaps the fact that they didn't go to the temple in the first place actually gives us a window, some insight into Mary and Joseph's mindset. Perhaps they were... Um, unwittingly beginning to deal with Jesus as though he was an ordinary boy. I mean, after all, though, it, it's understandable. I mean, what, what ordinary 12-year-old um, um, decides to stay behind in the temple to uh, converse with the eminent doctors of the law? So in one sense, we shouldn't be too harsh on them, but in another sense... They knew who he was.
and they find him, don't they, in the temple. Conversing with these doctors. Well, this was no ordinary boy. The angel told Mary that her son was to be the son of the highest. And I think there is a lesson for us here. We can become so familiar with the things of God that we end up taking them for granted. And maybe, just maybe on a deeper spiritual level, that what was that was what was going on with Mary and Joseph. Perhaps they were taking Jesus a little bit for granted. They were becoming very familiar with him, perhaps treating him uh, as if he was just an ordinary boy and nothing but an ordinary boy. And you know, we can take things for granted as well. Just like the public worship of God. It's only after we have been deprived of these means that we realise that we actually miss them. That we actually really want them back. And maybe there was a lesson, just a subtle lesson here for Mary and Joseph. Well, let's think a little deeper about the words of verse 49. I've titled our sermon as The Boy Who Was God. And I hope that title instills in each and every one of us um, a profound sense of the awe, joy and wonder of this passage. The boy who was God. Even as a 12 year old, he is aware of who he is. He knows why he was born and for whom he was doing his great work for. And those are the thoughts that I would like to take as our headings. So our title is The Boy Who Was God. And there are three thoughts with the Lord's help. Firstly, he knew who he was. Secondly, he knew why he was born. And thirdly, he knew to what end he served. Firstly, then, he knew who he was. Perhaps Mary had said nothing to him yet of the mystery of his birth, which is why she refers to Joseph as his father, verse 48. But his reply to Mary revealed otherwise, and he reveals two things. He he reveals firstly that he knew he was the son of God. He was the son of God. He says, my father's business. That meant he was the son. The only begotten son of the father. In other words, there was and is a unique father-son relationship in which the father begets the son and the Son, in turn, is begotten by the Father. These are said to be uh, the peculiar properties of the Father and the Son within the divine essence, within the Trinity. The Father begets the Son. The Son is begotten of the Father. Now this, of course, it can roll off the tongue very easily, but to actually understand this is something else entirely. This is... This is a profound mystery to us. The ideas of eternal generation and the begetting are actually very, very difficult, almost impossible to, to really enter into. But the scripture has revealed it, that we are to understand it in this way. That there is in the divine essence and <clears throat> an internal and eternal Relation, which in some way is like the relation between father and son among men. Now that does not mean that the father, with respect to the divine essence, is greater than the son. There's no um, subordination between the father and the son within 
the Trinity, but simply that the Son has an eternal and necessary relationship to his Father. In other words, there is um, uh, an intimacy of oneness. Oneness. There's that intimacy of oneness. And the boy Jesus was already aware of that oneness, of that intimacy, of the fact that he was one with his father, even as a boy. He was the creator and he knew that to be such. He knew he was the ancient of days, the prince of life, the one whose birth was foretold by the angel. And note that he showed no signs of any internal struggle or inward confusion. There is no um, identity crisis with regards to our Lord's realization of who he was. That there was no identity crisis. He is the son of the living God. And he maintains that over and against Mary's assertion that Joseph is his father. Now, whether this was a slip of the tongue or if there was some uh, intention behind her use of these words, it, it's not clear either way. But she says, nevertheless, behold, thy father and I have sought thee only for Jesus to return. No, no, no. My father, my real father, my true father is in heaven. So there's a sort of play on words here. And I think. Mary begins to realize on a very small scale that this boy was her Lord. He knew he was the son of God, but secondly, he knew that he was the son of Mary. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Son of God, yet the son of Mary. Mary's blood ran through his veins. I dare say he probably even took on perhaps some of her physical characteristics. Perhaps he looked a little bit like her. Perhaps you could tell that he, he, he was the son of, of Mary. Of course, he had nothing of Joseph because of the Immaculate Conception, but surely he would have taken on something of her looks. He was the son of Mary, and Luke attests the truthfulness of the human nature. For in verse 52, he wrote, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Now, how are we to understand these words that he increased in wisdom and stature? Well, with respect to the divine nature, there can be no increase of any kind because God is unchangeable in his being. So this must refer to his human nature. And what a tremendous thought that is, friends, that our Lord increased and yet he increased without any sin. No sin at all. His manner of growth, therefore, must have been unique. He was never hindered. He was never impaired. He, was, he, was, he, was, he wasn't affected the way that uh, we are by sin. And that's almost impossible for us to imagine. A child growing up and yet without sin. No temper. No lies. No mischievousness of any kind. Perfect. He knew who he was. He was the Son of God and the Son of Mary. Two natures gloriously distinct and yet incomprehensibly united in the one divine person. He knew who he was. And Christian friend, you know who you are as well. What I mean by that is that you have your identity in Christ. And in, in a very different sense, we as well have two natures within us. We 
have the old man and we have the principle of grace. There are, as it were, two natures and these are contrary one to the other. Now, I am not for a minute suggesting that um, Christ's two natures conflicted in any way far from it. I'm just simply saying that we have two natures as well, but very different from the two natures of Christ. But our identity is ultimately found in the Lord Jesus Christ because we are saved in and through him. So many young people today, especially, seem to struggle with this. They, they seem to struggle to discover who they really are. And many, sadly, allow their sexuality to define them. Which, of course, is sinful as much as it is tragic. But this is not so with the Christian. The believer derives his identity from Christ. He is a Christian. He is, as it were, one of Christ's little ones. Our identity in Christ then ought to impact every area of our lives. First and foremost, you are a Christian before anything else. Before your callings as a mother, as a father, as a grandparent, as a worker, whatever it is, First and foremost, you are a Christian. Now, of course, the believer wasn't always a Christian. But by grace, he can say with Bunyan's pilgrim, My name is now Christian. But my name at the first was graceless. Our identity is in him. So he knew who he was and we know who we are as well. We are Christians. But secondly, he um, knew why he was born. Verse 49 tells us that he came to do his father's business. And there is something very matter of fact here about his reply. And, and I think this verse tells us something about what he was like as a boy. He was serious yet happy. He is quiet, yet active. He was obviously very mature. There's, there's a sense of gravitas to him. And what I find deeply moving, and perhaps this is the reason why I keep coming back to it, but what I find deeply moving is that even as a 12-year-old, he wants... To save sinners. He had a concern for your salvation. I find that so moving. That a 12 year old. The boy who was God. Had a concern for you. Because as he said. I must be about my father's business. Does it move you, this scene? Perhaps it hasn't moved you in the past. Well, pray that it moves you now. See this 12-year-old. Very innocently, very matter-of-factly, yet so endearingly, say to his mother, I'm here to save sinners. I must be about my father's business. So he came to perform his father's will. My father's business, that's how it comes across in the translation. It can actually be translated from the Greek as either in the things of my father or in the house of my father. And either interpretation suits the context very well. He was literally in his father's house, in the temple, the place where the Shekinah glory once was, and he was at the same time in the things of his father. He being in the way, the Lord led him to the temple. And here he was learning, sitting at the feet of the doctors. And and with respect to his memory, uh, we, we must perhaps um, satisfy ourselves that he had a perfect memory. He had no sin. He must have had a perfect memory, albeit relative to his age. 
So when Joseph showed him something in the carpenter's shop, he must have learnt it and that was it. He didn't forget about it. We read in the scriptures elsewhere that he learned by obedience, which is a, a, a tremendously deep verse that we don't have time to think about. But he learned. He learned in our nature. And, and friends, that is staggering humility. That God, who is the fountain of all knowledge, would in our nature learn again. That is humility that that really goes beyond words for us. So he was about his father's business. And very few of us as 12-year-olds know for certain what line of employment we will end up in. But Christ did. The Lord Jesus knew. The word business, uh, as we have it, I think is an excellent word. Um, our AV translators picked. Business um, denotes a formal economical activity. Well, was he not on the greatest business trip, if I can put it like that, of all time? Was he not engaging in, in the greatest business activity known to man? Was he not um, in economic relations um, with respect to uh, the creatures that he had made? Was he not bound up in the economy of grace, this economy of salvation? Redemption, in short, was his business. That was why he came. Saving souls was his business. Vanquishing death was his business. Satisfying divine justice was his business. Destroying the works of the devil was his business. He came to do what no one else would or could do. Namely, be the living sacrifice for sin. And that solemn lesson, friends, would have come home to him vividly as he saw um, the blood of the Passover lamb sprinkled. Remember, this was his first Passover visit to Jerusalem. And, and how vivid it must have been as he, as he heard the priests singing the wonderful Hallel. That is Psalms 113 to 118. To think that in 21 years, on that very day, he would be hanging on the cross outside Jerusalem, shedding his blood. The propitiation for our sins. What a staggering thought that is. And the reality of that, the smell of it, the sound of it, the, the colour of it all, that, that must, have, um, must have left an indelible mark on him. Now how much he understood um, of what lay before him at this particular point is unclear. But of this we are certain he knew who he was and he knew why he had come. That was his father's business. And being his father's business, it was urgent business. He says, I must. You see, there was no other way God could save man except by punishing Christ in our room instead. And we teach and we preach that the atonement or the atonement was absolutely necessary. For God cannot pardon a sinner without the adequate satisfaction of a sacrifice. Something to appease his wrath and to satisfy that justice. Well, Christ, being our substitute, being our covenant head and surety, must take our nature. He must suffer. He must die. He must rise again from the dead. 
He must do all these things. Therefore, he must be about his father's business. There was no time to lose. Here he was now on the greatest mission of all time. To save sinners from the wrath to come. And he would do that by becoming the object of divine wrath himself. Well, we considered our identity in Christ, but what about our business in Christ, if I can put it like that? Are you about your father's business today? We are sons and daughters by adoption. So we have a business. We have a work to be busy about. Well, what do you think this work entails? What do you think is involved in your father's business? Well, surely it is living a life of faith and obedience to Christ. Dying unto sin. Living unto righteousness. Growing in grace and in the love of Christ. Loving Christ more and more and more. Well... How are you getting on with that today? How are you getting on with carrying out your father's business? It's difficult perhaps to be mindful of spiritual things in a state of lockdown. But surely these times of isolation should not be times of spiritual isolation but rather of activity unto God. We all need to be about our Father's business. Are you today, in whatever capacity you find yourself in, are you diligent in the things of the Lord? So he knew why he was born, but thirdly and finally, he knew what end he served. He came to glorify his father. In John 17 he prayed. Father the hour is come. Glorify thy son. That thy son also may glorify thee. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. His incarnation. His suffering. His death. His resurrection. His whole life was geared to one appointed end. To glorify his father which was in heaven. That was the, um, the silver thread that ran through all his actions. He was always mindful of his father. You see this time and time again in the gospels. Particularly the gospel of John. Where Christ speaks about his father. I and my father are one he says. And elsewhere he talks about not doing his own work. Or even speaking his own words. But those which the father committed to him. He is there to um, save sinners who were um, committed to him by the father. He was always thinking and talking and praying to his father. He appreciated his father. He adored his father. And he ultimately acquiesced to his father's will. You know, your chief end is to glorify God as well. This is why you are here. In fact, why any of us are here. As the Shorter Catechism, question one puts it, we are here to, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This is, as one Puritan put it, the yearly rent we pay to the crown of heaven. The human nature is created for that very reason, to glorify God. And that explains actually how Christ could glorify his father in the first place. As God, this was impossible but as the God-man, as the servant, in his human nature, he could glorify his Father. And you know, we would do well to imitate Christ in this respect. So I'll just say this in conclusion. Let us firstly, like Christ, appreciate our Father. Christ was always talking about his Father. He had high and lofty thoughts of the one who loved him. Well, let us be like that. Let us 
have high and lofty thoughts of our God. And, and we glorify God most when we admire him. So let us admire his creation. Let us admire the work of recreation, the work of redemption in our souls. Let us admire his wonderful works of providence in our lives. And let us truly appreciate our Father, the one who provides for us, the one who has said, I will never leave thee, I will never forsake thee. Lo, I am with you all the way to the end of the world. But Christ also secondly adored his heavenly Father and we're to adore our heavenly Father. Let us worship him with reverence and godly fear. You know, our worship is very, very important. We perhaps don't always appreciate just how important this is in our lives but God is jealous of it he guards it and he would have as it were the fat of the sacrifice the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving which is our affections that is what he wants most in our worship today he wants your heart my son give me thine heart that's what he wants the fat of the sacrifice in the Old Testament was always the choicest part. And so our affections are the choicest part of our sacrifice of praise and of thanksgiving. Do you give him your heart in worship? Do you come in faith and repentance? Thirdly, let us acquiesce to our Heavenly Father's will. That is not always easy, is it? It was... Uh, a struggle, if that's the right word, for Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. His human nature shrank back from the cup. And yet in the end, he, he brings his own will into line with that of his father's. And he says, yea, not as I will, but, but as thou wilt. Well, we're to do the same. Let us seek grace, friends, to, to, uh, to know obey and submit to his will in all things because if we do these things and these are just some of the ways but if we do these things we are said to be glorifying our father our actions will glorify him our prayers will glorify him our good works will glorify him and in so doing we will magnify him in uh, the eyes of others i began the sermon by saying that mary and joseph may have been guilty of treating him as an ordinary boy. And after that encounter in the temple, we, we read that Mary kept all these sayings in her heart. I imagine their return journey to Nazareth was a quiet, reflective one for them both. If they were guilty of taking him somewhat for granted, then his temporary absence from them taught them to appreciate him. And I think that lesson was, was, was wonderfully reinforced when he said that he was about his father's business. So here he is, as a 12-year-old, standing on the brink of adulthood, knowing who he is, why he was born, and to what end he served which was, of course, the glory of his Father. May we be the same. Let us glorify our God. Let us love our Saviour. Let us appreciate him. And let us, friends, just stand back in awe and wonder over this passage. Even if that's the only thing that you were to do, that would be enough. Just stand back in awe and wonder and appreciation and joy and, and fear over the boy who was God. Well, may the Lord bless that portion of his word to us. Amen. And let us pray. Gracious and heavenly God, we thank thee for thy word and we bless thee that it reveals something to us of the grandeur and the glory and the wonder of Christ. Things which angels look into. O oh Lord, may we just stand back in awe and wonder over this passage. May we be given to be moved by it. May we be reminded that, that he was at one time a, a young boy. And a boy who 
who loved his father and obeyed and respected his parents and did all that was required of him and so much more. Give us a love and may this passage increase our admiration for the Saviour. Bless and be with us and pardon all sins committed in holy worship. For Christ's sake, amen. Well, closing item of praise uh, shall be Psalm number 40. Psalm 40. And we'll just sing a, a couple of verses. Psalm 40 and at verse uh, 8, we'll sing two stanzas. To do thy will I take delight, O thou my God that art, yea, that most holy law of thine I have within my heart. Within the congregation great I righteousness did preach, though thou dost know, O Lord, that I refrain it, not my speech. The Psalm 40 is a messianic psalm, and verses 6 to 10 especially um, reveal to us something of the thought life of the Saviour um, as he was here on earth. And he says in verse 8, to do thy will, I take delight. And these are words that we are to um, echo ourselves. To do thy will, I take delight. To do thy will, I take delight. Although my God that art, yea, that most holy Lord of thine, I have within my heart, within the congregation did preach Oh thou dost know O oh, Lord that I refrained not my speech And now for the benediction the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.